Great to be here. Everyone excited about 5G? Yes. yes. What is the coolest application you can find with 5G? You don't know, but we're going to talk about some of these applications. But imagine a big robot like this IC4000 from uh, ABB. And when they came and we initiated a lot of collaboration with them, and what is the killer application with 5G? And you start to think about, like, let's have that robot moving around and they do crazy stuff. And in the end, it turned out to be something that is so small like this. <laughs> if you can guarantee reliable communication, wireless, that a worker like this, stepping closer to a big machine, automatically have a wireless emergency stop. That's powerful. So the, there is no like magic killer application, but this is an example of when wireless communication becomes so stable, reliable, and secure that you dare to cut the wire to an emergency <coughs> stop. That's powerful. Does it mean that we are there yet? We're on a journey. <laughs> but that is my target. Making such a reliable communication wirelessly that you can have an emergency bottom wirelessly. Yeah, Eric mm -hmm. Josephson. I'm head of advanced industries at Ericsson. So my job is to make sure that industrial sites, factories, warehouses, mines are actually being ready for 5G as we're introducing it now on a global scale. Well, a little bit about the Ericsson. I guess maybe some of you guys know who we are. <laughs> it's a 140 years company like we have been forever, starting with the days of telephony. We could call someone, or we know where we're calling a place, connecting all the buildings, but we didn't know who we were actually calling. That is where we spent the first 100 years connecting buildings across the globe. So now we have presence in 180 countries. Last 40 years has been about introducing mobility. First up with 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, and now, of course, 5G. You may be familiar with some of these. Maybe some of you guys were actually using some of those phones back in the days. 2010 was an, a mad, a quite a crazy year. That is when for the first time when data exceeded voice in the networks globally. Around 40% of all the data in the world go through Ericsson network. And that year, we passed with data. Now voice is just noise, as we say in the network. <laughs> we want to get rid of it. <laughs> it's all about data. Now though, we're stepping into a new era. This is the first G that is ever done with the help of industrials setting the requirements of the wireless communication. Before it's only been focused on the consumers. So now we're gonna, now we maybe don't call anymore, but you don't know who you are calling or contacting and where it is, because all of a sudden it's machines. It is a little bottom like this, or the full IoT. So it's an exciting era, connecting all these millions of factories across the globe. But let's take a step back, where do we come from? I'm based in Stockholm, Sweden, and this is 100 years before I was born. The reality of connecting telephony, which means you put the cable to each and every house. And here's around 2,400 cables to each and every house initially here uh, in uh, part of Stockholm. Reality back in the days, consumers, you're all wireless. Why would you ever buy fixed telephony to your home? I don't think you do that anymore. <coughs> but the reality in factories is that when you step in there, there are kilometers and kilometers of cabling. And as soon as you start to connect and the full world of Industry 4.0, the IT, OT, communication coming together means more and more cabling. So that's why I had my vision of cutting cables and enabling a full wireless communication also for industrial sites. For you guys out there, you just want to have stable, secure, simple, reliable, and at the cost. That is on the right level. Uh, wireless communication. Today, the only way to get that 3S is to do cable. 
but it's inflexible. We can all agree to that. Or you go for something called unlicensed, which means that it's a, in the era of wireless communication, you're using Wi-Fi, LoRa, Zigbee, Bluetooth, and there is nothing wrong with Bluetooth. It's actually super good because it's an Ericsson invention. <laughs> but it has its limitations. So I'm going to introduce you a little bit about the new gold and the diamonds of the digitalization era. And it's about spectrum. Spectrum is not easy to remember and understand. But we're going to do a little bit of it. Going back to basic on spectrum, then going back to basic on 5G, and give you some examples of what we're actually doing with some applications and what we actually are doing today with that one. So let's jump into it. The data highways. It's getting congestion. I had a lot of, uh, I was staying. It took me 20 minutes extra to get here because it was raining and it was congestion on the, co on the roads, right? But this is the reality. More and more things are being connected. And as soon as you put load on the networks, it has a tendency to go down. Everyone can play in an unlicensed spectrum scenario, which means that when you guys all turn on your uh, local hotspot with Wi-Fi here, if I were a machine, I would crash soon because you guys interfere with my network. That's in the unlicensed space. If you step into a licensed scenario, this is where you have 4G, 5G type of communication, of course it looks much better. <laughs> this is just a mental picture, but here is where it's toll gates, so it's actually very restricted who's actually playing on that road. And why is this important? Because you can visually understand all other type of communication where you put cables and so because you actually see it. But in wireless, you can't. <clears throat> So how does that look like for real? We talk about bands, we talk about spectrum. And what is spectrum? Back to basic. We have low bands, mid bands, and high bands. If you're putting Wi-Fi or any type of unlicensed, you're on 2.4 gigahertz with your Wi-Fi back home, somewhere around here. Or you're putting in the new uh, five gigahertz. Sometimes people get confused. I got 5G back home because I have 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. But this is what's happening right now, is that we are evolving, and with 5G, we're actually starting to activate all bands, which means that on the low band, mid band, and the high bands. <coughs> but why does this make sense? This is maybe for some of you guys, like, I don't know, this is strange, because you can't touch it. So I will try to explain spectrum in a way that you all understand. Mm. I guess you're a business, Ladies or gentlemen here, so you're playing golf, right? <laughs> okay, there we go. And we'll see if you get this. So on the low bands, this is where we have the, the driver, which means that you can shoot really far, but it's not that accurate. This is where you have LoRa, CB, and others too. Imagine a radio, you tune it in on FM. Very good coverage, but it's not that much data. Mid bands, this is where you have iron clubs. You can be quite flexible and be quite accurate too. And for the first time now, we're going to introduce the power. Millimeter communication, meaning down to very, very accurate, high bandwidth, low latency. And by combining this, we get superpowers with 5G. Okay, now if someone asks you about the different type of bands, gigahertz, you can think about the golf clubs in the future. Now we do basic for 5G. You're all playing chess, and you might remember that number. So golf clubs, now we go to chess. Six superpowers of 5G. 4G, if you build a dedicated 4G network, which we're doing together with Advantech and others, you get really, really good powers. And this is the bandwidth, this is the king of communication. How much can you actually send in one second? And we can get up to one gigabit <coughs> per second right now, which is really good. On your Wi-Fi back home, maybe you have 100 megabit per second. But the problem with 4G was that we built it for consumers, which means we thought about streaming, looking at YouTube or similar, which was downlink. Now we see industrial applications more about uplink, an HD camera, uh, video surveillance, have to be uplink. 
So we're changing that game now. And with the long-term superpowers of 5G, this is not that you're going to turn it on tomorrow, but it's going to evolve. You're going to get up to 10 gigabit in all smart link, 20 down link. It's going to take some time. It's a couple of releases until you get those superpowers. But this is the vision. That's why it's future-proof. So that's the king. Queen is about speed. Getting from 10 milliseconds down to 1 millisecond. Amazing. Reliability. Why would you even deploy this in an industrial site if you don't have very reliable and stable communication? That's the towers. Mobility. I didn't find a good use case for this for a while, but then when I talked to some of these airplane and also rail companies, they were like, this is awesome. For the first time with high speed, we can get beam forming and know exactly any high speed and reliable communication there. Positioning. I know that all of you guys, or many of you, want to know exactly where things are to create your digital twins of the future. It's going to come in the latest stages of life. But this is a couple of years out until you get down to this and then load on the network. You can have millions of devices. Okay? So next time you play chess, you can remember some of the superpowers of the future of 5G. Okay? But this is the journey. And you can start already today with uh, 4G. We are here right now. We're connecting PLCs, asset condition monitoring, inventory management, AR, VR, similar things that you can do on the consumer side. You can also move into the industrials. AGVs is one of the most common use case. You're connecting robots or AMRs. Uh, autonomous mobile robots. And then step by step we're pushing the envelope down to lower latencies and new releases of 5G. Because 5G was similar as LTE, long-term evolution, which is where we are today with 4G. It's an evolution. So we are in the release 15, which means this is the good capacity that we can do today. Then it's coming release 16. Even more powerful. This is where we talk about URLLC, ultra reliable low latency, time sensitive networking, all the way on to industrial automation. Release 17. So it's a long standardization, and we are leading that standardization game from Ericsson. Most patents is coming from Ericsson in the world right now. Okay, that was some bragging. <laughs> but <laughs> imagine that on the massive side, it's where you connect a screwdriver. Broadband, you start to connect to workers. Critical, here you start to connect robots. And in industrial automation, that is when the, all three are starting to work in real time together. And we are working across the globe. Good collaboration starting in Europe. But it's quite technical tests in Europe. The real business start to happen in Asia and in the US. And it's starting to take off now. So this one is already a little bit old. So let me give you a couple of examples of what we're doing together, actually also together with Advantage. Scania is doing big trucks, but most of them in their production sites want to test and go in towards full wireless communication. And here is their lab that they do in uh, south of Sweden. And we actually use Advantage uh, compute capacity in our local private network, starting with 4G today. So getting ultra wideband, smaller tags, but backhauling with 4G, connecting some of the robots, and like screwdrivers from Atlas Copco. So more and more use cases being realizing in these type of labs. I said AGVs. Here is together with Ostram, <coughs> connecting AGVs, using actually part of their public network which is a bigger antenna outside, but then slice it so you have a dedicated slice for the factory and then the rest is for the public. There are different ways to deploy private networks. Here's uh, one of the more extreme cases, a BLISC. When you create a jet engine, you need to mill a big piece of metal and that piece of metal costs around 100,000 euro. Extremely expensive and take 15 to 20 hours to do the mill. And it's six axles machine, which is impossible to do something with wire in there. But we managed to put a sensor inside through that thick layer of metal, 
beaming it with NR, the new radio, which by the way is 5G. So if you see on your phone in the future, NR, new radio. Okay, sidetrack. This was the world first that we started to connect these type of sensors. So we know exactly what's happening in the milling process. If something goes wrong, we can stop it. Impossible to do before. Connecting robots, and this is where we usually talk about how you can move more computing power up in the air instead of having it in as a physical uh, brain next to the robot. PLC, Programming Logic Controller, is usually the size of the double size of this for a big industrial robot, which means a lot of unnecessary space plus inflexibility. Can you move that piece up in the air in the edge with low latency communication? Start to be interesting. So we start to move the task controller with LT, worked, motion control controller with 5G, and now we're on to five milliseconds. So a big piece of this PLC can be reduced, so it's much more flexible. And we're also going to the low ground. Uh, this is an example from Canada. We are now connecting 90 kilometers of tunneling. One single radio antenna replaces I think it was 60 Wi-Fi access points. So you're simplifying the network significantly by us using radio instead of Wi-Fi. And let's go into some of the extreme cases. Why would you need 5G here? I might need some help to be able to play this. So when you start to introduce 5G, you can also remotely steer machines. So this is me driving an, uh, a machine remotely. It's a couple of kilometers away with 5G, with 4K, live streaming, and haptic feedback, as you see, that share is moving exactly as that machine is doing. And by, when we started to do some of these, it became big business cases for the industrial sites. Instead of actually sending people down in the mine, you can now remotely control it. A2B, as I mentioned in the beginning, we have a lot of collaboration with them, putting robots on mobile AGVs, so the future would be fully flexible production. Also, the first time we did this haptic feedback in 2016 was with APB, controlling a robot and you get instant feedback. So, how could a network look like if you deploy it in the factory? It could be everything from our absolutely smallest antenna, like an, a radio dot, it's like a dot, <laughs> that you deploy. And uh, this is something called our most light touch uh, private networks called Industry Connect. You get eight of those, your own edge compute and control environment, and you have your own dedicated network. So you burn your own SIMs, put that into your machines, and you control your network. No one else can touch it. Extremely reliable and secure. And together with uh, Advantech, we are testing things, and one thing that we tested just a couple of weeks ago was to see, okay, can I then take a Mitsubishi controller or machine and, oh sorry, the machine and the PLC <coughs> controller usually you always need to have the cable between. But we take one gateway from Atlantic on the one side, another gateway on the other side and with a QTEL uh, module and go profnet wirelessly over LT. And it works, simple. Very easy case to start with. But then you can imagine the future where you start to build this one more in and you can make more advanced type of applications. But this is just one example of where we're starting to cut the cables that is not necessary in the future. You can move this type of computing power further away and maybe even virtualize it. And talking about virtualization, we launched a partnership with NVIDIA to actually virtualize our radios and making more and more up in the cloud. And with that, I would like to introduce our other speaker, right? <laughs> From NVIDIA. So we're collaborating with Advantech, but also with NVIDIA. Thank you.